Hi, I've got an interesting bit of low-cost test gear kit for you today. 100 megahertz, little portable oscilloscope. Um, isn't it kind of cute? And it's only 70 US dollars for 100 megahertz bandwidth. So if this, I have no idea how it performs, I'm about to find out. But if this is any good, it's, it's quite a remarkable bargain, although this is not quite pocket size. Look at the thickness of it. But, you know, it's got a real BNC on it, only single channel. But, you know, these little pocket oscilloscopes and things, they're real, you know, dinky little toy things and the bandwidth's not there and all the rest of it and not really partial to those. But this one, with a proper BNC on it, 100 megahertz bandwidth, you know, building lithium ion battery, all the rest are, you know, a reasonable size screen, I guess, and reasonable looking controls for what it is. Um, then if it works for 70 US dollars for 100 megahertz bandwidth, wow, from a company called FNI RSI, and they're apparently the company that make it, got it from their official uh, store, I guess you'd pronounce that Finersi, Finersi? something like that 512h and they make lots of other gadgets they um also have a previous sort of like little pocket portable oscilloscope but this one looks much better the interesting thing is is that uh i'll, I'll put up some photos here have a look at what it looks like on the website and it it just looked fake it looked like photoshopped and they are so i was curious to see what this thing was like and if it performs so let's go you get a nice little uh, zippered uh, pouch thing it's got no branding on it um it comes with a probe it's a yeah it's just a typical one hung low uh, times 10 switchable probe it's what you'd expect you know seems okay and a usb cable and an instruction manual and the instruction manual is all in english here um is a versatile highly practical cost effective handheld oscilloscope for the maintenance industry and r d sampling rate of 500 meg uh, samples per second which is enough for 100 megahertz bandwidth you've got uh, five times no worries it can withstand building high voltage protection can withstand 400 volts continuous and hate 100 volts peak um that'd be in times 10 mode of course it's got a 320 by uh, 240, 2.4 inch display, uh, up to 64 meg storage. It can capture 2000 waveform pictures. <laughs> the storage process is simple and fast. <laughs> Just one touch, no cumbersome tips or and choices. <laughs> Quietly, it is very convenient to save the current waveform. So yeah, a bit of chinglish happening here, but it, it's okay. Thumbnail browsing, detailed viewing, page turning, deletion, uh, 3000 milliamp hour battery, high quality, <laughs> 10 hours for a full charge. I'm not gonna bother to uh, test that. I'll just, you know, take it for granted. Any skid, any shock, shock proof. Comprehensive protection of the fuselage. <laughs> Love it. So there's the specs, uh, 3 nanosecond rise time, 128K storage depth, storage, so the actual uh, sample memory is 128K afterglow, <laughs> that's persistence mode, <laughs> 1 to 8 adjustable, 12 kinds of parameters. There you go, you can screen, you can pause this and have a look, common problems and stuff like that, but you know, they've done a reasonable enough job there, I think. Oh! PW and signal measurement of MOS tube or IGBT. Wow, they've got like example things. I don't believe it has any uh, protocol decoding either. And it comes in the classic uh, Chinese packaging here. Of course, they, they don't waste any packaging material over there. They, they reuse everything. The angle of the display, it does dim a bit at lower angles like this, but it's still, still holding up okay. It's best uh, front on. The top angle is, you know, it, the, the graticule vanishes, basically vanishing at really high angles, stuff like that. But, you know, it's doing a reasonable job. You'd have to go outdoors and have a look. As far as the user interface here goes, I, I don't mind it. Um, it could be better, could be worse. But anyway, I like that they've got a 50% uh, trigger button, a dedicated uh, AC DC button. You can see that change up the top. Uh, dedicated times one times 10 pro button. That's very nice. You can see that change from five volts to 50 volts up there. I don't know what F1 and F2, they're obviously a uh, programmable function to measure. Don't know if you can change those. And a dedicated edge trigger button, which looks like it just goes positive, negative like that. There's no alternate trigger function, as in like positive and negative. It looks like it's either one or the other. Eh, it's a bit limiting. 
Now this mode button here is not what you think. Basically, um, these buttons here, uh, it would have been nice if they had some silk screen on here uh, to tell you, but once you get used to it, it's easy. So up and down, of course, changes, uh, it's fairly intuitive. It changes your vertical scale like that. And of course, obviously, this one changes your horizontal scale. Now this is a bit weird. It's got your regular one, two, five uh, sequence up here, but when you get down low, 25, nanoseconds, 12 nanoseconds, and 6 nanoseconds that would have to do with uh, the sample rate and the memory uh, depth and stuff like that. But that's the lowest, 6 nanoseconds per division. It's a bit oddball, but anyway, and it goes up to 50 seconds per division. But if you hit the mode button here, you can see that change, and you might be able to guess that moves your waveform around. You know, it would have been nice to be able to just center it back, but, you know, beggars can't be choosers. So a basic one kilohertz sine wave here, of course, we can change our triggering edge, that seems to work fine. And uh, it's a little bit off, it's actually four volts uh, peak to peak. On my SIG gen, we're getting 4.12, it's bang on on the frequency though. What's interesting is if you put it in stop mode like this, watch this. It seems to have some data outside the display window, either side. So that's interesting, it's capturing more than uh, what's on the screen. And it's got an auto set button, let's try that, I've moved the waveform around. So auto set that, and bingo, it's uh, centered it, it didn't, it centered the vertical, didn't center the uh, horizontal back. There's a few little user interface things you could argue, aren't they great? Now it's 4.08, so it's getting closer, I'm not going to quibble over 4.08 versus uh, 4 volts on my uh, siglent gen, that's fine. Now your trigger button actually changes your trigger mode. Uh, it's not a trigger menu at all, so rudimentary. So that'll go into our single shot trigger mode. We're in stop mode now, but then you can put it in normal mode like this. And geez, it's a fair bit of jitter in normal mode. I don't know why. There's our trigger level there. Geez, that's pretty how you're doing. Anyway, that does move our trigger level. Look at that. Wow. Oh, and then it's going jittery like that. So then it, whoop. Why is it not? Yeah, it's just it stopped, of course. You'd expect that in normal mode, but. Yeah, uh, not impressed by normal mode there. It's a bit how you're doing. But you put in normal um, auto mode, and that's, you know, that's fairly rock solid. But of course, we can't change our trigger point in auto mode, which sucks. Why? Why? And as for those functions, it looks like, you know, if you wanted RMS, it just changes. Basically, you've only got the two parameters on the screen there at any one time. But that's all right. It's just a little pocket scope for getting, you know, basic waveform measurements. This is absolutely right off the bat. It's no substitute for a bench scope. Anyway, what do we get in menu here? We've got view wave. Um, there's no enter button. You press mode. Yeah, you press mode. And there you go. Okay, what? And there you go. It's showing the waveform. That's our saved waveform. That's, you know, kind of shows it as an icon view. That's kind of nice. So there we go. There's a one kilohertz square wave. Then we'll go in there and we'll view our wave like that. And there it is. Let's select that. And it's popped it back up. It's kind of neat. Can you do measurements on that afterwards? Oh, look. You can just scroll through them. But, like, there's no measurement cursor functionality in it. Um, like, after you've done that, you can't go in. It's just a screen capture. You can't actually go in and analyze any of the waveform or data. So, meh. Might have some limited niche use, but, meh. It's disappointing. Time measure, for example. We can do, oh, frequency. Okay. So, well, let, let's just do time. Oh, that's showing it there. Ah, oh, I thought that was cursor mode. Aha, auto 50%. That's more why we may not be able to adjust our trigger point, I suspect. Now, can we change? Yeah, there we go in auto mode. There you go, auto 50%. So we can change that now. And bingo, there we go. Yep. Cool. Nah, no worries. I take back that. That it was a bit limiting. Afterglow. <laughs> Afterglow, of course, is going to be our persistence. So, uh, oh, that just sets the level. How do we actually set the mode? I'd, oh, we might, um, I'll, I'll put my standard waveform in. Standard one megahertz sine wave with uh, one kilohertz, 100% amplitude uh, modulation on it. And well, it does, it's not handling that very well, is it? Most scopes don't, that'll, that'll be quite common. And that operates like most scopes. It can't handle the trigger on that. Let me change the trigger level up to here somewhere. No, we're not going to be able to see that modulation, I don't think. 
No, that's not going to be uh, terrific, and it's not triggering on that. A lot of other scopes have trouble triggering on that too. But we're not, it looks like it doesn't have the on-screen memory depth to actually um, show anything there. Let's put in stop mode, and then see if we can zoom in. No, there's your problem. You can't zoom in. We've got no extra data. So all you've got, so much for your 128K sample memory. That's what it said it had, right? 128 kilobyte storage depth. Well, where is it? We've stopped our waveform and we can't zoom into that. We can move it around. That's hopeless. Anything else we've got on here by the looks of it is brightness and that's it. So yeah, this thing is really rudimentary and I, I'm oh, disappointed that you can't... 128K memory would have been useful, but it looks like it's only got the, the display memory. You know, the, the 320 uh, samples across and that's it. I can't find a way to zoom in on that. That is very, very disappointing. Uh, yeah. Well, there's our alias in. I'm feeding in 100 megahertz uh, 4 volt peak to peak sine wave. There's some offset there as well. <laughs> so, of course, if we go to zoom in on that, it should come good. There we go. But no, there's certainly, certainly some offset there. That's not coming from my generator. And if we do this, look at this. We have some average sampling. Like, it's almost as if it's in an average sampling mode or something. That, that's... Really quite weird. Anyway, there's six nanoseconds uh, per division. It's measuring it, 100 megahertz, but uh, 460, uh, 470 millivolts. Um, it's a four volt peak to peak signal. So we're, looks like we're not getting our 100 megahertz uh, bandwidth. Of course, a bandwidth of a scope is specified at three dB down. So uh, 0.707 of four volts. Get your calculator out. You can work out that little bit of uh, DC offset. So let me wind the frequency down. Yep, it's going up. Let me... Whoa. <laughs> Have we got an averaging mode turned on? Hi, this is the T800 model, Dave, from a few days into the future because I actually uh, finished this video and I released it to my patrons, as I often do, uh, patrons and uh, forum supporters, and a couple of people uh, pointed out that... Uh, the reason I was getting a low bandwidth, they reckon I'd come a gutter because this times one times ten switch here was actually a physical hardware attenuator inside, and in times one mode, it's only got like five megahertz bandwidth, and that why I was seeing a terrible bandwidth. Well, that's actually not the case, but uh, as we'll see, but this actually led me to do further tests of this thing, and it does kind of sort of meet its bandwidth spec up the top here, 100 meg. But, nee, no, that's not the full story. But of course, that would be completely abnormal because no scope, no real scope, has a times one times ten uh, hardware attenuator inside. It's just a software multiplier on the screen. But it turns out this one actually does work the same way. So even though it does actually say in the manual down here about this uh, 5 megahertz uh, bandwidth like this, they're actually talking about the uh, the times 10 probe. And I've done a whole video on uh, a times 1, well, limited bandwidth on times 1 probes. I'll have to link that in. But yeah, it turns out this is just a, uh, a software multiplier like all other scopes. But this thing, as you're going to see, it doesn't really, kind of, sort of, meets its bandwidth, but it doesn't. It's it's a figment of your imagination. Um, so if this video is a bit disjointed and kind of doesn't feel a bit right, sorry about that. It's kind of a mix and match of like old and new clips. So I didn't want to reshoot the whole thing because I that's not what I do. Anyway, let's go. What I've got now is a, uh, a proper connection with 50 ohm terminated, okay? And I'm feeding in one volt um, with the 50 ohm load at 100 meg. So we're supposed to get one volt. And we confirm that on a, a Keysight 200 meg scope, 100 megahertz, one volt peak to peak with a one to one uh, software probe option because we're not using a divide by 10 probe. So we don't have the software option enabled, okay? But we plug the same thing into here and we don't get it. It's just silly buggers. There you go, 312 millivolts. Wah. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just uh, calibrate uh, this probe. So I've got uh, just a one kilohertz uh, square wave here, and I'm going to give it a little uh, tweak a deek to make sure it's right. Otherwise, we'll come a gutsa 
and we'll get our wrong amplitude and I've set the uh, outputs no longer to 50 ohms so there you go I reckon that's uh that's square as look at that well what the heck is that I am down at the minimum like there's something there okay and <laughs> look at this six nanoseconds that is not working okay it's doing some funny business there and uh, there's also talk on the uh, EV blog forum that this does not have proper 500 meg samples per second and as we'll see in the teardown yeah that's probably the case so let me wind the wick down on that frequency okay check this out I've gone back I've actually uh, changed it to uh, 10 volts uh, peak to peak here we get our nice uh, square wave like this which uh, we compensated for okay it's okay in that range watch this look at that this range here when you change ranges your compensation changes so uh, this <laughs> this front end is so dodgy brothers that you can't even compensate your probe and have it be the same over all of your voltage input uh, ranges that's just nuts so I've got to now get in there and recalibrate that I can't even I can't even I can't even compensate it I can't even compensate it on that highest voltage range are you kidding me that's just nuts wow nah nah this is this is just silly okay so let's check the bandwidth in times 10 mode and to do this properly using the supplied probe we're feeding in a one kilohertz square wave we're compensated it properly uh, and we're using 50 ohm output uh, termination here we've got a 50 ohm output terminator and we're probing it correctly over here and it trust me it's in the times 10 position over there matching times 10 on there so we are now in the ideal position to measure this bandwidth here let's give it a bull and there you go with the 5 volt uh, peak to peak we expect uh, times 0.707 we expect 3.53 so it's actually slightly bigger than that so it's going to have a bigger bandwidth so if we keep going we expect that to drop 5.3 yeah let's call it there 107 megahertz so it does actually have 100 megahertz bandwidth of course we can't use the probe the probe is hopeless we can't compensate it on its highest voltage range um so we we changed to the 10 volt range and we, we just can't do it and then of course you got this complete silly buggers if you go up a range i mean that's just nuts you could easily think that that is your actual waveform that's going on there because it, it should go off screen that that is just nuts to have to have it do that is just that that is inexcusable this is at 10 megahertz now okay so if we well that's normal mode just doesn't trigger it's just unbelievable anyway if we go down a range look we get our expected result so it, it goes over range like that and we're not getting the silly buggers because it's we've got the necessary uh, sample rate and memory to do it but yeah um, at, at the high frequencies no nah, you're going to come a gutter look this only happens at 100 megahertz watch this go to 101 doesn't happen go to 99 doesn't happen this thing has a ridiculous uh, software sampling beat problem I, I'm struggling to find a correct terminology for this but yeah this thing is completely coming to guts are trying to sample at these high uh, sample rates and it's just it's just going nuts it can't do it and as for this times 1 times 10 button it doesn't physically change the waveform so it's not doing it it's not a divider on the input i it looks like it's just a software uh multiplier just like on a regular scope and this thing definitely has a strange peaking in the response i'm in uh times uh 10 mode but i'm feeding directly in via coax with 50 ohm terminated okay so that this thing will be rock solid we're taking all the cables out of the equation and watch this if I lower this frequency we'd expect that amplitude to pray stay pretty constant but look jumps all over the shop like that at about 45 megahertz crazy and just to prove to you that's not my uh, function gen 57 meg drop it down 50 45 it's rock 
solid. There's nothing wrong with that gen at all. So it's this puppy and it is one sick puppy. So if you ask me where the usable bandwidth of this thing lies, I would say, look, here it is, right? It's, you know, 20 meg, 20 meg, right? It's going up, it's going up, it's going up. Everything's fine, right? So I would say usable bandwidth before that front end and sampling system starts doing funny business, 42 megahertz, let's say like 40 meg. Beyond that, yeah, it just goes crazy. Now, either I'm on some serious drugs or that waveform is moving and bouncing around and going, whoa, 40 meg. It's just going, whoa, and that's in auto mode. And of course, single shot capture mode. There we go. Oh, that's why. Look, you can see that there's, there's not a lot of samples in there. That's not a particularly good sine wave, is it? And normal mode is absolutely useless as tits on a bull. And if we take it up a range, whoa, yeah, we can really see that start to jump around and do funny business. So I'm, I'm going to say it's not even 40 megahertz. That's starting to look more rock solid, isn't it? At 20. So, yeah, can we say that's, yeah, it's doing all right. Anyway, um, yeah, you can't use it as a normal scope because it just doesn't, the volts per division, it's, I'm feeding in five volts. Trust me. Look over here on the key side. I can I can change my probe. It's not it's not 50 volts. <laughs> there we go. It's 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 five volts. But this thing shows like three and a half, even at 20 megahertz. It's just no, 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 no. Yeah, 100 megahertz, my ass. Oh, I had a bit of hope for this, but no, 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 no. So this is really starting to disappoint now, and well calibration so maybe that was the offset uh, thing so let me run that pulled out probe and USB yes I have success there we go okay so it calibrates itself let's try that again well I tell you what at 10 megahertz look it can't even can't even trigger it can't I, I'm in normal mode of course it works fine everything works great in this magical auto mode <laughs> come on it's smack in the middle look give me a break I'm going to see if I wind the frequency down, does that eventually come good? 2 megahertz, 1 megahertz, no, it still, it still doesn't come good. Wow, it can't even trigger in normal mode. 1 megahertz. Again, if we switch that over to auto, anyway, I'm at 26 megahertz. I'm going to wind up the wick. And uh, it seems to have fixed the DC offset there, so that, that calibration seems to have done the business. Anyway... Okay, I'm going to go into single shot mode. I've got my trigger level set above there. So it's armed. Let me wind the wick up, see if it captures. Yep, there we go. Works. So it does single shot capture. Looks like a uh, micro for charging. That looks really deep. You might have trouble. Yeah, as I su suspected, they provide, like, that looks like an extra long micro USB so that's that's kind of annoying and the power on off switch so if you want to see it boot there you go um, don't know if you can do firmware upgrade or whatever no idea anyway that's what it looks like nude there's nothing else on the bottom it's just a, uh, a plastic jiffy type box let's crack it open and we have self tappers of course but you know that's what you'd expect so that's yeah uh, yep, battery in the back oh that, that actually looks quite neat doesn't it I like that there's our battery, just whacked in the back. You could actually retrofit a bigger one. There's a bit of unused space in there. So, geez, there's not much doing, is there? The analog front end, I do like how they've like laid it out. Look at the nice, neat rows there. I like Somebody probably took a bit of pride in that. I, I don't mind that. Is there anything on the bottom? And nope, zippity doo -dah are on the bottom. There you go, just got our membrane keypad. There's our BNC and our LCD. And that's all she wrote. So the main processor here is an ARM Cortex uh, M4. It's a Giga Devices 32F407, and this is a bit of a monster. It's got like, uh, I believe it has like three meg of uh, flash in it, like 192k of uh, SRAM. Looks like an SPI Winbond uh, flash memory over there. That'd be for saving all of the uh, waveforms. And this is interesting. Look at this. There's a mystery device over here with absolutely no markings on it. 
I've looked under there and it doesn't look like it's been scrubbed off. It looks like it's actually been supplied without any silk screen at all. And that's clearly your uh, analog to digital converter. You've got your output here. Uh, we've got a wiggle, 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 yeah, trace there, which is serpentine trace. That's just uh, length matching. That'd be uh, the uh, sample clock. So anyone want to uh, reverse engineer the pin out there and try and figure that out? All right, well, let's go check out the input. Down here, we've got ourselves a uh, solid state relay. This is our AC coupling cap. You can see it's just basically shorting out that AC coupling cap, and that's driven via directly from the micro down here. So exactly as expected, uh, we've got some diode protection here and all this stuff here, this looks like an input divider with uh, compensation caps across there. Why have they got two? Hmm. Anyway, got ourselves a real fair dinkum relay there. That's pretty good. And these, haven't looked at the data sheet, um, they would be Photomos relays, would they? And then we've got a whole bunch of trannies down here. Looks like they're driving uh, these relays over here. And we've got ourselves a little uh, 5 pin SOT23 amplifier in the way between the output of all of our uh, front end switching and the ADC. So that's just, yeah, it's just, you need a driver for the ADC, obviously. So the signal's coming in like, like this. It's been AC coupled like this, and it's been divided, this input uh, divider resistor here. And then you've got this long divider chain here, and it's all compensated. It's got double compensation caps on each one. And then you've got the input uh, capacitance of all of your switches here, which these, these taps, one of these taps. Um, so we've got one in the center of that, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, we've got eight. Oh, what? Oh, there'll be one at the top end, of course. So, yeah, it's it's tapping off all of those, and then you've got the input, like you've got the capacitance of, of these as well, upsetting the apple cart. And when you've got a huge, big divider like that, then you're going to come a gutter. Um, it's just, this front end is just not designed for high frequency, like we saw, like 46 odd megahertz before it really starts going silly buggers and non-linear. But then you couple in the fact that this thing is clearly not sampling at 500 meg samples per second, because there's no way that uh, this micro, uh, what is it? I think it runs at 168 meg or something, megahertz or something, is it? Anyway, you can't use this generating the sample clock for the ADC over here. Um, somebody on the EV blog forum has uh, reverse engineered this, by the way, and they I'll provide a link down below for the reverse engineering thread. I didn't know about this before I started uh, shooting this video, and they've identified that as an analog devices or a clone analog devices uh, part. I'll put in the uh, part number. Look for this thing. You can't generate 500 meg samples per second with a micro. It's just not possible. Look, there's one oscillator over here driving the micro. The micro drives the clock for this. They're just not doing this right. This is not a proper um, oscilloscope architecture. And okay, you might call it, you know, you might be able to eke more than 20 meg out of it or something, but I would say no, it's basically going to be like a, you know, 20, maybe 40 at the toss, maybe 50, if you're absolutely pushing it. But as we're seeing, the compensation on this comes a gutter. Nothing's accurate in this thing. It's just hopeless. Nothing much doing there. That'd be a charger. Not even going to go look that one up. And then we've got some, uh, oh, 74HC 148s. So they'd be driving the keypad. That's about it. And then some, um, like, a power on reset -y, uh, to, uh, no, the voltage regulation there. Yeah. So basically, they're just uh, asking this uh, poor little uh, front-end circuit to do too much <laughs> for 100 meg, and it's just coming to guts. Uh. I, I like the fact that it has uh, some software offset uh, calibration and things like that, but yeah, this is not uh, by any stretch a uh, professional oscilloscope uh, front-end that you'd find in your uh, Rigols and your Siglins and your key sites and everything else, which, you know, we're used to pretty simplistic front-ends these days, but uh, no, they're just, no, this is too overly simplistic. So I can't possibly give this thing a thumbs up. It just doesn't do the business. And it's unfortunate because it had 
a lot of potential and it's a great uh, like the actual build quality and feel of it and everything's fine and I don't mind the user interface and things like that I I think you know and the button interface and stuff it it, it has a reasonable amount going for it Unfortunately, they've just come a gutter on a couple of hurdles here, and maybe um, this new hacked uh, firmware, this completely reverse engineered uh, firmware from scratch, um, might be able to, you know, make this into a more usable uh, platform, perhaps. But yeah, uh, once again, uh, for whether or not, is there anything else? this capable, <laughs> this capable in quote marks um, for, you know, 70 US dollars is a good value. I don't know unless I did a shootout and I don't have any of those uh, DSO nanos or DSO quads uh, left to actually do a comparison uh, shootout. I gave those away to uh, beginners. So as a standalone product, no, it does not get a thumbs up. In fact, it virtually gets a thumbs down because um, they've just goofed this and it does not meet its claim. So it, it's got to be a thumbs down. But it might be a usable platform uh, for some people. You know, if you just want to view uh, some waveforms or whatever out in the field and, you know, stick under 20 meg or something and you don't care about the actual reading. No, no, this is, uh, anyway, might be useful for someone. I'll provide a link down below anyway. But uh, yeah, I'll provide a link to the reverse engineering of the forum of this and it'll be interesting to see um, what any additional uh, firmware uh, can do for this baby, but yeah that and the fact that there's just no hardware triggering on this It's all uh, done via software triggering. So yeah, you can you know, improve the software in this regard But and it needs to be improved because the the stock software on this thing is absolutely horrible so That that front end um, there's not much saving that you're not going to get a hundred meg out of that for sure And the sample clock is just it's not going to do the business. No way. I don't even have to measure that don't even have to measure the sample clock to know, oh god, all right, I'll measure the sample clock. Now, first things first, this is at 6 nanoseconds per division. You can see that's not sampling all the time. It's sampling in a little burst. We'll zoom into that at the moment. But that's a 34 hertz, 34 waveforms per second. But hey, you don't expect much more for a uh, micro, purely micro-based system like this. So you can see that we've got uh, two clock lines here. And of course, all these data lines coming out here, this is for one ADC, this one's for another. So there's actually dual ADC inside here. So the one I was just uh, probing is this one over here. Let's probe this one here and have a look. And you can see this one's actually opposite polarity to this one here. So... That's interesting. Oh, well, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. They're just, maybe that's just a software quirk. They're just idling the line high instead of idling it low. Anyway, if we zoom in on this, okay, we single shot camp and capture that. And we're looking at, yep, 121 megahertz there. So 500 meg samples per second. My ass. 25 nanoseconds per division. Still hanging in there at 50. And 100 nanoseconds, yep. It does not change until 500 nanoseconds per division, and it changes quite drastically. Um, it's dropped down to 25 megahertz, and the opposite one's not coming through at all. So obviously it needs uh, both of the ADCs in there to get uh, the highest sample rate at the highest uh, time base settings. But even then, it's definitely not 500 meg samples per second. It's only 125 meg samples per second. But with your dual ADCs, you can interleave those to get uh, 250. But like how it's getting the throughput of the data into the um, SRAM into here at this sort of rate. And of course, it, it, it's got nowhere near the 128K of memory, even though this thing has 196K of uh, SRAM inside of it. But yeah, it's, a, a, it's the most rudimentary system you can possibly imagine. And of course, at slower time-based settings, they only need to use the single ADC. So yeah, no, this thing is just um, coupled with the um, input uh, amplifier here, which is yeah, pretty how you're doing uh, with its long um, <laughs> compensated divider chain. You're always going to come a gutter on that and just direct sampling straight into your micro using your uh, <laughs> GPIO uh, pins. And I'm surprised they're pushing, they could push that to 125 megahertz actually. So, yeah, but uh, maybe some firmware can help improve this thing, but there's no way this is ever going to be a 100 megahertz bandwidth scope. Not a chance, maybe 20. So there you have it, that's the Finercy 512H high performance 
Um, no. <laughs> Reduce performance, little pocket oscilloscope, and well, I, was I foolish to expect much for my 70 US dollars, but anyway, it did have potential, but unfortunately, um, it's just let down by its relatively poor performance and uh, lack of options, you know, and yeah, it's only single channel, um, but hey, that would have been good if it did actually have a decent 100 meg front end on there, and if I had some decent options in the software and the triggering worked better and the sample memory, you could actually zoom in on your waveforms and it, it just like, yeah, it's just oh, let down at the final hurdle, I think. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. There might be a niche use for this. Okay, I like the form factor. Kind of like the look and feel. I kind of like the layout and the options it had. It just it, it was just let down. Like just huge showstoppers almost, like, you know, the, the sample memory not being able to zoom in and it not working properly in just normal trigger mode. Um, I, and the lack of the bandwidth, so uh, I'm not sure I can recommend that unless you got some niche application. Is there better value for 70 bucks? I, I don't know unless I did a uh, shootout, but yeah, no, I was hoping this would be a winner winner chicken dinner, but uh, it ain't. But, you know, it might be useful for some people, a little field uh, pocket viewer waveform you don't care about uh, zooming in and the auto mode's good enough for you and the bandwidth is good enough for you and, and whatnot, maybe. But anyway, I'll leave a uh, link down below if it uh, does suit your purposes. No, there's nothing else to write home to my mum about. In fact, there's nothing to write home to my mum about apart from the 70 bucks. But even then, no, I, I can't give that one a thumbs up. Anyway, let me know what you think down below in the comments and over on the EV blog forum, as always, which is the place to discuss test equipment, the number one test equipment forum on the internet. No doubt about it. Catch you next time.